You're listening to the N2K Space Network. Quick question. Do your end users always, and I mean always without exception, work on company-owned devices and IT-approved apps? I didn't think so. So my next question is, how do you keep your company's data safe when it's sitting on all those unmanaged apps and devices? 1Password has an answer to this question, Extended Access Management. 1Password Extended Access Management helps you secure every sign-in for every app on every device, because it solves the problems traditional IAM and MDM can't touch. And it's now available to companies with Okta and Microsoft Entra, and in beta for Google Workspace customers. Check it out at onepasswordcom slash cyberwire. That's onepasswordcom slash cyberwire. It is not an overstep to say that history was made in the space industry over the weekend. I don't think there was a single space nerd on the planet who was watching Starship Flight Test Number 5 whose jaw didn't drop when Mechazilla caught the returning booster in a movement that would have made Mr. Miyagi proud. Man who catch fly with chopstick accomplish anything. And it's not even just the next generation of spacecraft that has us so excited. The Europa Clipper is heading to Jupiter's icy moon right now, and it could bring us closer to answering the eternal question. Are we alone in the universe? What a time to be alive. T-minus. 20 seconds to LOS. T-dress. Go for the floor. Today is October 15th, 2024. I'm Maria Varmazes, and this is T Minus. SpaceX says success with Starship's fifth flight test. The FAA approves Falcon 9's return to flight. Crew 8's return from the ISS is delayed until Friday. And our guest today is Wanjiku Kanjumba, who will be chatting to me about her ambition to establish a spaceport in Kenya. Stick around for the second part of the show for more on that. Well, just a few things happened over the long weekend, didn't they? Let's get into it. SpaceX had its fifth Starship flight test on Sunday morning from Boca Chica, Texas at 7.25 a.m. Central Time. And as always with these flight tests, they had several objectives. But really, one big one for this time around. Have the Super Heavy booster return to the launch pad. And instead of landing on retractable legs, as we often see with the Falcon 9 booster, instead have the Super Heavy booster be caught by the landing tower's arm, commonly called the chopsticks. And cue the Mr. Miyagi memes, the tower was go for catch, and the chopsticks catch of the booster was a success on SpaceX's first try of this incredible maneuver. I'd bet good money many of you listening have already seen this video of the nearly 23-story tall booster returning to Earth and maneuvering its way back to the tower, and then about six minutes after launch, the booster comes roaring back. We can see those chopsticks now. <laughs> If you somehow haven't seen the video of this incredible feat of engineering, we will have a link in the show notes for you. The long, long-term goal of having super heavy boosters return via tower catch is for fast reuse. Landing gear can get damaged, and that adds time in between missions. But the vision is for Super Heavy to be caught, no landing gear needed, a new ship just stacked on top, the whole thing refueled, and then back to launch quickly. No need to schlep the booster to and from a landing site or from a drone ship, as it's already where it needs to be. So the successful catch here is a big step towards both getting bigger payloads to orbit, 
thanks to the Super Heavy Booster and Starship, of course, as well as launching those big payloads with incredibly high frequency. It's not hard to see how that is incredibly transformative for the space industry. So flight test number five, all the superlatives, definitely a launch to remember. And that's not all, if you can believe it. (laughs) A little over an hour after launch, Starship also made its complete orbit to its target water landing site in the Indian Ocean. It did basically explode after landing, and SpaceX did note that it was not expecting to recover Starship, but the company says it was a success as far as they were concerned, given that Starship returned from orbit and landed in its target zone. And so then came the next big mission for SpaceX, the Falcon Heavy's launch of NASA's Europa Clipper. The spacecraft lifted off on Monday from Launch Pad 39A at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The Europa Clipper is the largest spacecraft NASA has ever built for a mission headed to another planet. It's also the first NASA mission dedicated to studying an ocean world beyond Earth. The spacecraft will travel 1.8 billion miles, on a trajectory that will leverage the power of gravity assists, first to Mars in four months and then back to Earth for another gravity assist flyby in 2026. After it begins orbiting Jupiter in April 2030, the spacecraft will fly past Europa 49 times. Mission controllers at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Southern California have confirmed that the two solar arrays flanking the main body of the Europa Clipper spacecraft have fully unfolded. This means that the spacecraft now has a reliable source of power for the rest of its journey to Jupiter and a tour of the Jovian system, Godspeed Europa Clipper. Late Friday, we received notice from the Federal Aviation Administration that SpaceX's Falcon 9 was authorized to return to regular flight operations. The FAA reviewed and accepted the SpaceX-led investigation findings and corrective actions for the mishap that occurred with the Crew-9 mission on September 28th. Also on October 11th, the FAA closed the SpaceX-led investigations for the Falcon 9 mishaps that occurred with the missions Starlink 9-3 on July 11th and Starlink 8-6 on August 28th. So that means it's back to business as usual for now. After all the incredible news and all the superlatives from such a busy weekend, we should say that the busy weekend was not all that we had hoped for, not to be mean about it, but still. Following delays due to weather conditions near the splashdown zones off the Florida coast, NASA's SpaceX Crew-8 mission from the International Space Station got postponed again. Current forecasts indicate unfavorable conditions over the next several days. If weather conditions improve, NASA and SpaceX will target no earlier than 3.05 a.m. on Friday, October 18th, for undocking from the space station. The U.S. Space Development Agency has awarded the General Dynamics Mission Systems and Iridium Communications team a $491.6 million contract modification in support of its ground management and integration program for the proliferated warfighter space architecture. Iridium says its share has a value of $239 million over five years. This award follows an initial operations and integration contract award in 2022 to build ground entry points and operations centers and manage network operations and system integration services. And while all those big stories have been dropping in the United States, space industry leaders from around the world have been traveling to the International Astronautical Congress being held in Milan, Italy this week. We've got a few stories that have already been announced at the event, starting with Italy's D-Orbit, who have signed a 119.6 million euros contract with the European Space Agency for ESA's Space Safety Program. As part of the contract, D-Orbit will develop, launch, and demonstrate the capabilities of a vehicle designed to rendezvous with, dock with, and take over the attitude and orbit control functions of another spacecraft for purposes including life extension, relocation, repair, disposal, and more. The project is supported by the Italian government through the Italian Space Agency, along with critical contributions of several other space agencies and governments, including the UK Space Agency, the German Aerospace Center, the Swiss Space Office, and the Spanish Space Agency, AEE. The European Space Agency also used the IAC in Milan to kick off its Moonlight program with a contract signing ceremony. And the Moonlight Lunar Communications and Navigation Services program is a partnership project between ESA and an industry consortium led by space systems developer Telespazio, with support from the UK and Italian space agencies. 
The program aims to establish Europe's first ever dedicated satellite constellation for telecommunication and navigation services for the moon. Moonlight will be a constellation of five lunar satellites launched into space and carried by Space Tug from Earth's orbit to the moons. The constellation will connect to Earth via three dedicated ground stations, creating a data network spanning up to 400,000 kilometers. The first step in the program is the Lunar Pathfinder, a communications relay satellite manufactured by Surrey Satellite Technology, which is all set to begin operations in 2026. And also at the IAC, the Polish Space Agency signed an MOU with Axiom Space, building on Poland's role in the upcoming Axiom 4 mission. Axiom says this extension of the partnership pays the way for long-term collaboration in tech development, microgravity research, and public engagement. United States commercial space station company Vast have used the IAC to unveil their plans for the follow-on to their Haven 1 station, the aptly named Haven 2. The Haven 2 is the company's proposed successor to the International Space Station and the next step in Vast's vision to pioneer a path to long-term living and thriving in space. French startup Constellation Technologies and Operations has secured 9.3 million euros in new funding. Constellation is developing satellites to empower telecom operators to deliver high-speed, low-latency internet access from space. The company says the funding will enable them to conduct their first end-to-end connectivity tests on the ground and in orbit, and complete detailed engineering studies for the first two satellites of its constellation. France and Germany have signed on to the multinational force operation Olympic Defender. The U.S.-led operation represents a growing commitment among the closest allies in space to jointly strengthen defenses and deter aggression, ensuring space remains a domain that benefits all of humanity. Originally established in 2013 under U.S. Strategic Command, Operation Olympic Defender has expanded to a multinational effort that focuses to optimize space operations, improve mission assurance, enhance resilience of space-based systems, synchronize efforts to strengthen deterrence against hostile actors, and reduce the spread of debris orbiting the Earth. In spring 2024, the commander of U.S. Spacecom extended invitations to France, Germany, and New Zealand, with all three now on board. And if all of those headlines were not enough for you to whet your appetite for today, then we actually have additional stories linked for you in our show notes. Both are regulatory approval studies for CITUS space and inversion. Read all about them and all of the stories that we've mentioned, including the video on the catch in the selected reading section of our show notes. Hey, T-Minus crew, if you are just joining us, be sure to follow T-Minus Space Daily in your favorite podcast app. Also, if you could do us a favor, share the intel with your friends and coworkers. So here's a little challenge for you. By Friday, please show three friends or coworkers this podcast. That's because a growing audience is the most important thing for us, and we would love your help as part of the T-Minus crew. So if you find T-Minus useful, please share the show so other professionals like you can find it. Thank you so much for your support, everybody. It means a lot to all of us here at T-Minus. And now, a word from our sponsor, Multigo. Multigo's all-in-one platform for OSINT and investigations speeds up complex investigations from hours to minutes. Trusted by half of Dow Jones and governments around the world, it helps cyber threat intelligence teams, fraud analysts, and law enforcement agencies integrate the most relevant data and enhance situational awareness to combat crime and mitigate risks detect threats early, and solve cases quickly. Go to www.maltigo.com slash get a demo to explore how Maltigo keeps businesses and the public safe. That's www.maltego.com slash get a demo. Our guest today is Wanjiku Kanjumba, CEO and chairwoman of Vasilian. Wanjiku is an aerospace engineer turned entrepreneur, and she's working on the development of the world's first 
equatorial, commercially operated spaceport in her home country of Kenya. My name is Wanchiko Chebek and um, I was born and raised in Kenya, and um, I had the opportunity to come to the United States a couple of times when I was a bit younger. And I was able in 2011 to be in the United States to see the final uh, shuttle launch. And when I saw that, I, I, I remember talking to my family about it, and I, something popped into my head, and I was like, oh, wait. Why is that a lot of, you know, uh, a lot of the launches that happen in America happen in Florida? And I remember my brother uh, summarizing, well, there are various, like, you know, factors to it and background, but essentially he summarized it to me that I could understand. is like, oh, it's because it's the closest state to the equator. And then I had a pause in my head and I was like, wait a second, Kenya is on the equator. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> why don't we why don't we launch any rockets out of our country you know that that popped into my head at that time and uh, when I uh, got, came back to Kenya I, I got to learn about uh, Kenya actually did launch rockets during like the late 60s to the late 80s hmm. and uh, yeah I know <laughs> I, I did not know that I completely fessed up I had no idea yeah so there's there was a launch pad um, off the coast uh, of Kenya, uh, but it was operated mainly by the Italian Space Agency with collaboration with NASA, which also surprised me. Mm. Um, and uh, they they uh, they used a like an oil rig. They revamped it into a launch pad, and they were able to do twenty seven launches, and all of them successful. And I was like, Oh, I did not know that. You know, were they orbital, <laughs> suborbital? Like, what do we know? What kinds they were? I believe they were suborbital, but I was, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was, I was quite surprised. And this was definitely not something that I got to learn in school. So they, uh, they stopped launching in 1988. Um, and uh, the oil rig right now is just there. It's not being used. It's just used more of like a historical site, uh, but it's still owned by the, um, like the Italian government. I believe like they have um, a so-called like 99 year lease on the, on the property. Um, but Kenya itself doesn't really have its own like spaceport um at the moment. So I was like, okay, so that happened. That's pretty cool. But uh, would be kind of great, you know, if I could bring that aspect back into my own country. So that that started that that snowball effect of like, okay, I think you know, I think I would love to do this. Um, for my country, I don't really see why uh, the African continent cannot have its own like launch site, especially with the growing commercial um, space market that was kicking up in the uh, 20, uh, 2010s. But in perspective of that, I also obviously had my own passion about space and I definitely wanted to learn more about it. Um, so thankfully, I had the opportunity to uh, relocate to the United States and pursue my high de- higher education here. Um, so I got my bachelor's and master's in aerospace engineering and a minor in space uh, operations from Embraer Aeronautical University in Daytona Beach, Florida. And um, currently right now, actually, I'm pursuing my doctorate in aerospace engineering uh, in the University of Florida in Gainesville. Tell me about your vision. Yeah, so I'm looking into uh, establishing a commercial spaceport in Kenya. Um, just given the fact that Kenya's location by the equator just seems, you know, very advantageous on that factor. And then also, um, it, it doesn't coincide in such a way where it seems like, you know, somebody could just ask, why can't you just do it in America? Like, um, some of the arguments I've heard from people who, uh, uh try to go to uh, Brazil to do their launches, because that's also another country that's by the equator, but it's, you know, still close to the United States. Um, Kenya is in such a way where it's located not, you, you know, it's not sharing an ocean with America. So it's not sharing the Pacific. It's not sharing the Atlantic. It's it's literally by the Indian Ocean. So it's an entirely uh, a different ocean with a whole different uh, a connectivity to different parts of like other continents. And I, I like the fact that there's a lot of uh, advancements in the commercial space uh, market within that region by the Indian Ocean. So within the Middle East, Asia, Australia, and obviously uh, still being connected uh, through the Red Sea and the Mediterranean Sea with Europe, 
uh, it, 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 it just encapsulates that connectivity a lot more easier. Um, so just that beneficial type of location, just, you know, it just seems like a no brainer. And uh, yeah, <laughs> and really uh, just, yeah, it just, just the fact with that, with the commercial space market, and then also with space tourism, um, I've, I've had like various conversations with uh, investors and people who are running like launch companies. Um, uh, one specific invest, uh, investor that I've had a conversation with, he was like an early investor in SpaceX. And uh, he was basically telling me, like, you know, this whole thing, like, with the space tourism and Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin and everything. He 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 was like, hey, you know, you could throw out that idea of, like, instead of uh, them taking off from Spaceport America, just going up and then coming back down, why not open the, the avenue of, like, they launch from Spaceport America, come to the Spaceport in Kenya, land there, you know, they're, they're enjoying their time, just coinciding with the rotation of the Earth, and then take off from Kenya back to America. Like, why wow. not? Wow, yeah, why not? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, he was like, why can't you just open up like that that door of like exploration of uh, space tourism to different countries that way? Um, and I was like, mm, you know, yeah, sure. But yeah, no, why not? And for launch companies, um, I even as I was starting to uh, pursue this whole idea of like having like a commercial equatorial uh, spaceport in Kenya, I, I definitely needed to know if there was a market for it because, you know, if there's no point of you know, just having a glorified space bar just sitting there and not doing anything and not service anyone, who actually would come to Kenya to use that space board? I, I mean, it is, a, it, it is a very, very good idea. And especially as we look at how the space industry is becoming so global and we look specifically at the United States, um, capacity is so limited and is, is really and feeling the squeeze. Uh, you know, people, you know, launch providers all over the world and, you know, certainly up and coming launch providers as well. They're looking for places to launch from. And there's just it's it's very difficult to to find the shares of what's available. So and then additionally, Kenya having a highly educated workforce and also like geographically in a perfect location, really, it does make a lot of sense. It really, really does. So even talking to other like commercial uh, uh, people who are coming up with their own commercial uh, space ports or who have just started up within like this decade, they have that vision of like coming up where it it just like similar to how we started off like with ships, but now you know we have ship ports all over the all over the world, similar yeah. to uh, aircraft started off with the Wright brothers. Seemed like a very far fetched idea that you know man could fly, <laughs> and uh, now all over the <laughs> all over the globe we have a, ma- a huge amount of airports. It sounded like a niche concept, but now it grew up. Now if we we can travel to wherever technically we want to go on the planet, and that's the way um, the people that I've spoken to who are interested about coming up with their own commercial spaceports within their own countries. Yeah. They are also understanding, like, this is just the beginning. Like, this is now where we're starting up, where the the need for spaceports is now, like, obviously, like you said, it's increasing. There's, there's this huge demand, but not that much supply. I would love to bring back what I've learned back to my continent and open up that door of having a spaceport because obviously to me, I'm like, it's it's really great what Africa has been able to achieve like with the various space agencies that have opened up in the continent. Mm-hmm. And they've launched like a couple of satellites here and there and that's great. But in my head, I'm like, they definitely can't catch up to the United States in times of milestones or even, or even Europe. They just don't have the budget for it. And they have different priorities that they need to focus on. And that's totally understandable. That's totally okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And that's totally okay. But what I think is that having a spaceport would now enable, you know, people within America and people within Europe to bring in their equipment to, to you know, Africa. And that would open up the door for the younger generation to be able to see, okay, so this is the type of technology that's out there. They can get to learn and you know that exchange of resources and knowledge will now just build them up the opportunity to you know contribute within the space industry a lot more tangible compared to like you know seeing it like on a screen i believe that the best way for them to have the opportunity to contribute within their own homeland is to have like a space for to open up that that uh, that world for them
We'll be right back. Around every entry point and every clever attacker, Vectra sees the attacks others can't. How? Vectra has AI on it. Vectra's AI attack signal intelligence tells security teams where to focus, what matters. It wades through thousands of individual threat events so you don't have to. Attackers infiltrating your network? Vectra has AI on it. Attackers compromising your identities? Vectra has AI on it. Vectra AI, the integrated signal powering your XDR. Visit vectra.ai slash show me to learn more. That's V-E-C-T-R-A dot A-I slash show me to learn more. Welcome back. While those of us in the Northern Hemisphere have been enjoying the beautiful Aurora Borealis thanks to the more active than usual sun, our friends and listeners in the Southern Hemisphere have also been reaping the benefits of the active space weather patterns by enjoying the Aurora Australis, and Steve. Steve's a friendly but extremely rare phenomenon, and you should know that Steve is the mysterious companion of only the strongest of aurora, though it doesn't always appear with the strongest auroras and scientists still don't know why. Steve appears as a bright streak of purple and white light along with the greens and pinks of the aurora, and it is sometimes also called a proton arc. And no, I'm not making a weird joke, and yes, its official name is actually Steve. People in parts of Australia were enjoying the sights of the Aurora Australis and noticed Steve in the night sky. Australia's ABC News spoke with one Steve spotter in the Neen Valley, South Australia. Her name is Monique McGregor, who said, Once I realized it was the extremely rare phenomenon Steve, I turned my back on the spectacularly strong Aurora geostorm in the southern sky and concentrated on Steve. We're doing our part here at T-minus to raise awareness of Steve and help make more Steve spotters. Steve appreciators? Next time there's an aurora near you, Borealis or Australis. You can do your part too and spread Steve awareness. That rare white and purple streak in the sky, it is no trick of the light and certainly nothing to be afraid of. It might just be your friendly neighborhood, Steve. That's it for T-Minus for October 15th, 2024, brought to you by N2K CyberWire. For additional resources from today's report, check out our show notes at space.n2k.com. We're privileged that N2K and podcasts like T-Minus are part of the daily routine of many of the most influential leaders and operators in the public and private sector, from the Fortune 500 to many of the world's preeminent intelligence and law enforcement agencies. This episode was produced by Alice Carruth. Our associate producer is Liz Stokes. We are mixed by Elliot Peltzman and Trey Hester, with original music by Elliot Peltzman. Our executive producer is Jennifer Iben. Our executive editor is Brandon Karp. Simone Petrella is our president. Peter Kilpie is our publisher. And I'm your host, Maria Varmazes. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow. Now, a word from our sponsor. The Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute is currently seeking qualified applicants for its innovative Master of Science in Security Informatics degree program. Study alongside world-class interdisciplinary experts and gain unparalleled educational, research, and professional experience in information security and assurance. Interested U.S. citizens should consider the National Science Foundation's CyberCore Scholarship for Service Program, which covers tuition, required fees, university-sponsored health insurance, and a $6,000 annual professional development allowance, as well as providing a $37,000 additional annual stipend. Learn more at cs.jhu.edu slash MSSI.